Jonakota, it's Pauline from Mobile Health here, and it's my pleasure to introduce today our speaker, Dr. Michael Boyd. Michael is an associate professor with the School of Nursing and the Department of Geriatric Medicine at the University of Auckland. She's a nurse practitioner in long-term care and is co-director of Equinox, which provides education, consultation, and research for healthcare providers. Michael is the clinical lead for the New Zealand Quality and Safety Commission's Aged Residential Care Work stream as well. And her topic today is caring for, the complex older, caring for complex older people. And this includes webinar tips, tricks and tales from the trenches. So welcome back, Michael, and uh, thank you for joining us again. Over to you. Oh, thanks. Um, it's nice to kind of see you all today. Um, um, it's been quite a wild eight weeks for all of us. I, and I don't want another email about COVID myself. Um, however, uh, what I hope to do today is talk to you um, about, oops, um, I don't know what happened. Uh, Pauline, you might want to step in here. What's the matter? Oh, no, I don't know. There it goes. Okay. Um, sorry about that. I've got a strange thing. There we go. Uh, it's not letting me, there we go. Sorry guys. Um, uh, but just to um, talk to you a little bit about COVID deaths, just because I thought this was quite interesting. So one of the things that you hear on the news every night is you hear how many, you know, deaths worldwide, how many cases worldwide. But what's, um, what's been talked about in, uh, internationally is that a lot of people seem to be missing from those tallies. Um, so for instance, in the UK, if you look at the normal rate of death in the UK, if you compare it to other years, you can see that there are 57,000 um, uh, deaths, excess deaths, 41 of the 41,000 of those were were actually reported, but then what you've got is 16,000 that weren't reported as COVID deaths. And what we think now is that people in residential aged care internationally are not being are not being uh, uh, tallied very well in the in the totals. And I think that's really interesting. So in the Italy, there were 10,000 people that probably either died at home or died in residential aged care. And in New York City, that was 4,000 people. That, these are staggering numbers, actually. Then we look at Dear New Zealand. Um, and the red line there, what you can see is those are our deaths this year. And then the black line is the kind of average number of deaths. And in April, It'll be interesting to see if this trend continues, but as the lockdown happened in April, you can see that those deaths plummeted. Um, and I think uh, it's because we don't have, you know, because of like lockdown, we have less flu, we have less, um, you know, other communicable diseases. So watch this space. I think it'll be very interesting to see since New Zealand got on top of COVID so quickly, Granted, uh, the majority of deaths um, in New Zealand were people that were living in residential aged care. We know this. Um, however, the rate at which people uh, were infected in residential aged care is so much less than anywhere else in the world. So overall, we've been able to keep people safe. Um, uh, and I, again, I apologize. I, I, I'm, I, have in mind about the, the families that have lost loved ones um, overall. So my thing that I talk about a lot, and some of you probably have heard me speak about this before, is frailty and frailty. What's happened in the last 20 years is that we used to use the term frailty um, kind of without a definition. So we would say, oh, that person's frail or that person's frail. What's happened in the last 20 years is that it's actually now defined. It is a medical diagnosis of frailty. There is a reason why we say a person is frail. It, there are a couple of theories about this, but the majority of the theories are that as you age, you lose muscle mass, um, which is called sarcopenia. And therefore that it um, decreases your walking speed, decreases your strength, decreases your resilience. And that's the biggest thing about frailty is that you lose your resilience. And we certainly see this with COVID. I mean, it is just so clear with COVID that 
you know, there's a, the majority, well, not all, but the majority of younger people without other conditions bounce back. They're going to be okay in, in the face of a pretty awful virus. But what we're seeing is I think it's a, now about 60%, 70% of uh, all deaths of COVID worldwide are in people that are older, people that are over 75. Um, but as I always like to remind all of us, um, because it's easy to put frailty as they are frail, when actually they themselves, they don't feel frail. Um, all of us, um, don't feel old inside, um, and older, being old um, is always 15 years away. Even those of you that work with older people know this, that somebody who's 85 still thinks that, you know, old age is 15 years away. So what's important is we, I've been, you know, because I've been working a lot with the term frailty and the di diagnosis of frailty, I worked with a medical student and a geriatrician, Catherine Bloomfield, and what we wanted to know is, what do older people think about the term frailty? And um, we did qualitative interviews with people that had been diagnosed as frail, and it was really quite interesting. So one of the things we asked is, is frailty a word that you, know, you find offensive? And overall, they said, no, it's not an offensive word. Um, it's a fine word, there's not a problem with it. But then when we asked them, would you say that you yourself are frail, even though we know that these people were diagnosed as frail, um, they said, no, I'm not frail. And then we asked, why don't, why aren't, you know, if, why don't you feel like you're frail? And so some of the quotes that we got were quite interesting. And one was, um, cause I'm still vital. I'm still basically alive. I'm still, um, you know, interested in life. Another quote was, um, you know, I haven't got as far as I've gotten uh, because, um, you know, people can tell me I'm frail, but I didn't let that stop me. So that was another quote. And the other quote that I see a lot um, that represents a lot of older people is they just adapt. They adapt, they adapt, they adapt. And so with this last quote, it says, and that's the kind of thing that you, uh, that as you're getting older, I think if you don't give up, you know, you just keep on keeping on. And, and that is, you know, I see that so much with um, older people that, yes, we need to identify them and the things that they need help with, but we also have to absolutely remember that they are adults and they are still vital and important and um, have meaning for their own lives. What I'm going to base this talk on today is the frailty care guides. The frailty care guides, uh, we developed those through the Health Quality and Safety Commission. The idea behind this was, okay, so we have this diagnosis of frailty, which, which is a uh, geriatric, um, composes a lot of geriatric syndromes. And that includes a syndrome would be things like incontinence and delirium and uh, falls. Those are all have multiple causes and that's the diagnosis of a syndrome. So what we thought we would do is um, provide care guides to help all of us that work with those that are frail to kind of know what the best course of action is. So the, the care guide that I'm gonna focus on today, um, the first one is acute deterioration. And I thought this was appropriate because Although New Zealand's been really good at keeping people from getting COVID, um, just amazing actually, um, astounding. Um, one of the things that we have to keep in mind uh, is, is when somebody gets sick, what do we do about it? So one of the tools that is, has been used uh, internationally is called the stop and watch tool. The stop and watch tool is helpful. The, the stop and watch tool says, okay, so let's just articulate and think about what is different with this person. And, and usually this comes from a family member and or a caregiver, um, a, a healthcare assistant. And it's general, it's very, very general. So it's things like they're, they're just not themselves. That's an important thing to note. Um, talks or communicates less. They need more help. They're participating less in activities. They eat less, 
um, no bowel motions, they're drinking less, weight change, they're agitated or nervous, uh, they're more tired, weak or confused, they have a change in skin color, and they need more help with ambulation uh, or transferring. So again, great tool, and it's a really good tool to use with caregivers so that we're um, kind of honing in their vision for what we, what we need to know as, as registered nurses. But what happens with this tool, <clears throat> what it doesn't say, well, if somebody drinks less, then what do you do? If somebody, you know, is more weak, then what do you do? So what we wanted to then do is say, okay, for the RN, somebody says to you, look, the stop and watch tool says that these things are changed. What we wanted to do with the eight steps is to say, well, this is what you need to do next, is to help RNs to really systematically go through the process of evaluating somebody whose condition has, cha has acutely changed. So step one, and this is an important thing and often uh, I'm on call a lot as, as some of you know, and so um, some RNs that I speak to are just fantastic and tell me exactly what I need to know and some RNs, um, there's a lot of detail that's missing. Um, so the very first thing is to review their recent history, what's gone on. So if I get a call then, uh, and I say, so is this new? Is this not new? It, you know, have they had any recent medication changes? Have they had any other illnesses? Um, <clears throat> it really can help us hone down really quickly what's needed for that person. So review the recent histories, do observations, which we'll talk about uh, in more detail in a second, uh, recent medication changes, those medications can have such an effect on people. In the care guides, there's an SBAR form, uh, situation background um, assessment and re um, request, basically. And the SBAR form <coughs> is really helpful for you to um, collate your thoughts, to, to kind of think it through. It's a two page thing. What I always fear is that we make this a tick box exercise and that's not what it's about. What it really is about is to hone the clinical decision making so that you don't forget anything. Um, I've been doing memory evaluations for, <clears throat> I hate to say it, 24 years. And memory evaluate, I still have a, have a list, kind of a guideline that I just pull out so that I haven't forgotten because it's such a complex, um, uh, assessment. I pull it out just so I make sure I haven't forgotten anything and that's what the SBAR form should be used for. The SBAR form should not be used um, for auditing purposes or anything like that. I don't think it's helpful for that. So some of the medications particularly that I need to know right away if somebody's condition is deteriorating is warfarin, 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 or dabigatran or uh, dabigatran, however you want to say it. Um, or um, any other kind of anticoagulant is important. Um, I need to know if they're on insulin. That's a really important thing for acute deterioration. Digoxin, there's not as many people now on digoxin um, as there used to be, but certainly if they are and their condition has acutely deteriorated, we need to know that. And then any other medication changes or any other medications that might be causing uh, issues, um, uh, and I just was talking to somebody this week about um, her husband had been put on phenytoin for seizure medication and it just completely wiped him out. And they, he just didn't um, do well with that at all. So just any other new medications are really important. In the care guides, one of the things to kind of help you think through what could be going on is we've got some symptoms on the left there and some possible causes just to kind of hone your thinking down. It's not that you're going to be diagnosing things, but it helps as a, as a registered nurse to know why you're asking the question and to have that in your head before you ask the question. Um, because <clears throat> you might, they might send you, you know, the person you talk to, the nurse practitioner, the GP, whoever it is, might send us down a different road and that's great but at least you've got an idea in your head about what you're concerned about. And I think that's really important. So <clears throat> one of, some of the things I wanna just kind of highlight are falls. 
falls can be from, yeah, they just tripped over the rug, but falls can also be from cardiac changes, from dysrhythmias. Our dehydration is another big one that falls can be from urinary tract infections, <clears throat> TIA, CVA, of course. Um, the skin changes, uh, uh, rashes or wounds, so a, a DVT would be an example of that. Uh, bleeding, uh, if they're on warfarin. Shortness of breath can be certainly respiratory, but it could also be anemia. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and with pain, <coughs> it's really important to, um, to get a real clear picture of what type of pain it is, what makes it worse, what makes it better. So if you see on the right there, there's a tool that we use um, to help you just articulate more clearly what's going on. It's called Old Cart. Many of you know this one. There's other ones that are similar, PQQRST or something like that as well, but I don't use that one. Old Cart, so tell me when, it ha when, it, when did the pain start? Where is it? What's the duration? What's the character? Is it shooting pain? Is it an ache? <clears throat> what makes it worse? Um, what's associated symptoms? What relieves it? Um, and what it have been the treatments? So I'm gonna go back to old cart again. It's, it's not that you need to say in your notes, old cart. It's that what old cart does for you is help you clarify your thinking. So all of these tools are absolutely not about um, tick boxes. All of these tools are to help you clarify your thinking. That's all they're for. So step two, um, observations are absolutely critical. They are absolutely key. Um, and the one that I want you to really, if for somebody who's acutely unwell, is the respiratory rate. And certainly if we do have a resurgence of COVID, hopefully not, I really, really pray that we don't. But if we do, one of the first things that you're going to see is the respiration go rate go up. But that's also true for somebody who has a, um, uh, any kind of respiratory infection. What the observations require, however, is that you know what their baseline is. And so it's really important to have those monthly observations, even though they're not sick, so that when they do get sick, we know what their normal is. Somebody with COPD might always have a respiratory rate of 28 because of their COPD. So we need to know that. Now, respiratory rate depends on who you read and who what guidelines you use and there's a million different guidelines for this but 24 if they're above 24 think about somebody you know if they're above 24 risks a minute um there's something going on if their usual respiration is 18 to 20. um the other things to consider that we often don't possibly consider uh is a systolic blood pressure that's gone down Again, this really requires that you know what their usual blood pressure is, but a, a systolic blood pressure that goes down can indicate that they're entering into a sepsis, and so that's why it's really important. Uh, tachypnea, so, uh, sorry, uh, tachycardia. So if they have an elevated respiration rate and tachycardia, that doubles my concern about some kind of infection. And then, as you know, with older people, they may or may not uh, become uh, fever, uh, feverish. And so they, their immune systems, one of the reasons why COVID has been so brutal on older people is their immune systems are not nearly as strong, plus they don't have the other resilience. Um, and so a temperature that goes up, we all know this. Now with, with COVID, we've, we've had to really think about this 37.7 and whether you should do a nasal swab at 37.7. I'll tell you where I've gone to is I've gone to the Ministry of Health Guidelines and I've said, look, unless they have a temperature of over 38, we're not gonna swab. I have done several swabs of people that with a temperature of over 38. Um, uh, and we kind of just increased that level a little bit be because of COVID. Um, but generally, a uh, temperature of 37.7 or above is concerning but don't forget about the ones whose temperature has gotten worse. Um, so they're less than 36. We all love our pulse, ox, uh, pulse oximeters. Um, I certainly love mine. Um, uh, SpO2 of 90% or less is of course concerning. 
The other thing to do is to look at what the most recent labs have been. Um, I had a gentleman who uh, I got his labs, I was just doing a routine lab and I got his labs back and it had all these really strange um, low red blood cells, low platelets. And then I went back into his um, records and found out that if I looked at his other labs, nothing had changed. He has thrombocytopenia. If I just looked at those labs, I would have sent him to the hospital. But because I looked at all the other labs that he had and his thrombocytopenic um, uh, diagnosis, it all made sense. I went in to see him. I said, how are you feeling? Because looking at these labs, I thought he was on his deathbed. I went in and see him. He said, I feel great. I'm fine. <laughs> you know, so, so you've got to get it in context of what else has been going on with this person. Versus, and I'll give you another example, is somebody who's had regular sodiums, um, 135 to 145, they've been just fine. And then all of a sudden you get a lab value back and it's 125. It happened to me with one of my recent uh, un, uh, residents that I was seeing. The, the fact that that sodium had dropped so far so fast, it's the, you, you know, really made a huge difference. And I would not have known that unless I would have looked at previous labs. On the other hand, you have people with congestive heart failure who chronically run 126, 127 sodiums and they're kind of fine because for sodium, it's the rate at which it falls and how fast it falls. Um, the body uh, can over time kind of get used to low sodium, but if it falls fast, you have uh, acute changes. So signs and symptoms of shock um, and sepsis, basically. Um, these are important to look at. This, is, uh, this comes on quick, and before you know it, that person is gone. That person has passed away. You've got to keep an eye on um, the signs and symptoms of shock. So it happens quick. Uh, they might be a little sick, and then they get a little more sick, and then all of a sudden, they're, they're really sick. It just can turn very quickly. So the things to look for are hyperglycemia, uh, hyperthermia or hypothermia, uh, hypothermia, just as we talked about. Take a look at those white blood cell counts. Um, make sure that uh, if you do have some new labs or if you get new labs, see if that white blood, blood cell count is elevated, which will tell you that they have infection. Tachycardia, tachypnea. So that sounds exactly um, what we were talking about before the OBS. What we're really trying to do with those OBS is we're really trying to see if they're getting septic, sepsis or shock. So what you're going to see with shock is hypotension. Uh, they can't get their, you can't get their, their oxygen sats up of 90. They often will have elevated creatinine or bilirubin levels. They'll have a low platelet count, so they're at higher risk for bleeds. Sometimes what can happen um, with septic shock is that they have a petechial rash, and this is the one that you'll see, uh, for instance, with meningitis. And it's this kind of, it, basically what it is is rupturing of small capillaries. And so it's a red-brown spot. And as you, if you push on it, it doesn't blanch. It just stays nice and bright and red. That's a huge red flag. Now, in aged care, and I'll talk about this a little bit later as well, in aged care, one of the most important things is that we know what their goal of care is. Um, sometimes uh, I've certainly had the situation where the underlying quality of life and uh, severe, severe underlying chronic illness, dementia or whatever it was, shock has been, uh, we've recognized it, we've treated with palliative care, the person was comfortable, so we weren't surprised when the person died versus somebody who is doing well, that person uh, needs to go to hospital immediately. The next step that's important is hydration. And the poor nurses that I work with know that the first thing out of my mouth is going to be, so how much fluid have I had today? I, I can tell you, and I can almost hear their eyes roll when I ask that. Um, but it, hydration is absolutely critical for frail older people. They don't feel thirsty. They, particularly as they get delirious, they'll refuse fluid, uh, which makes it, you know, five times harder. 
they'll refuse their medications. That's one of, um, Julie Daltrey and I are working on a tool for acute deterioration. And one of the things that um, has been in the literature and what we certainly have noticed in my practice is that delirium is one of the first signs as they refuse their meds. You know, that is a huge kind of red flag, like, oh, they took them yesterday, why aren't they taking them today? So I have a very low threshold for using subcut um, fluids. I know some people have a difference of opinion on this. I personally have seen it do amazing wonders, actually. Usually how I'll, I'll think about it is if they haven't taken in by mouth um, um, more than six, 700 mils in that day, and they're starting to look delirious, I need to think about some subcut fluids. Now, the first step of that is to offer little often, offer a little bit of fluid often. So every hour go in with 50 mils and just see if you can get them going um, orally. That's the first choice to do. The second choice, if, if you've tried everything to get this person to drink some fluids, is to give them a few days of 500, depending on if they have congestive heart failure, 1,000 mils a day. I usually do 500 that, and then do the rest PO during the day. I do 500 overnight. Um, you know, it's amazing to see these guys come back. I do want to tell you a precaution though, and, and this isn't a really important thing. Uh, so I had a, a, a resident who had dementia, it was really hard to get her to take fluids. Um, and I did her and she was going downhill. She was having an acute deterioration. I did her labs and um, found out that she had the highest uh, sodium I have ever seen. She had a sodium of 176. And I can't, couldn't believe she was still with us actually. So what was interesting about this is so usually the vast majority of the time, the reason people have high sodium is because they're dehydrated. So do I just throw a bunch of fluid at, fluid at her at um, sodium of 176? No, you don't. She needs to be hospitalized because if you have a rapid um, reversal of that hypernatremia, you can actually cause demyelination. So, you know, uh, giving fluids for somebody whose sodium is you know, 150, 155, 60 maybe. Um, that gets a little tight, but 150, one, you know, a little bit, 150 uh, ish. I a little bit of fluids and their sodium comes right. If it starts getting really a lot higher than that, you really do need to think about um, sending them to hospital so that they can have hospital supervision for that. Um, for that. Uh, to help with the dehydration and the, and the hypernatremia. And then there's delirium, and our friend delirium. Uh, never forget about that post-op del delirium. Um, every person pretty much that I see come back with a hip fracture that has had a um, operation for that hip fracture is delirious. It's just part of it. Um, they're refusing their meds. They don't want to drink anything. They're confused. Um, so, um, Anybody who starts to look like they have delirium, uh, depending on the person and depending on the clinical reasoning, um, it is important to get baseline labs. Um, that's when, again, you find the, the electrolyte imbalances. That's when you find the, um, uh, that their um, glucose is, 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 you can also do a, a, a finger stick. Um, your analysis is a really important full blood count to look for anemia or white blood cell count. Um, renal function, has their renal function gone down all of a sudden in the, so they're, they're not uh, excreting their drugs. Liver function, same, they're not metabolizing their drugs. Um, serum medication levels, again, digoxin, phenytoin, um, anything that uh, can, has a narrow therapeutic window is important to do. Um, I quite like the delirium screen, the 4AT. Um, the 4AT, we used to use the confusion assessment method, but the confusion assessment method uh, is not as clear as the 4AT. I think the 4AT is just pretty straightforward. Um, and it asks some questions of the person so you get some objective measures. And, I, and there's a lot more subjectiveness with the CAM. Both are fine, both are, are very much validated but I just find the 4AT uh, a little bit more clear. 
So what do you do when somebody um, is delirious? It's all the basic nursing stuff. It is absolutely good basic nursing care. So the first is treat pain, treat dehydration, really important. Give them oxygen, treat the hypoxia. Make sure that they don't have um, urinary retention or fecal impaction. Constipation can certainly send somebody into delirium. I'm sure those of you that work with old people have seen it a million times. And you, you, they, the bowels clear, and all of a sudden they clear up. It's quite, it's quite magical actually when that happens. Um, but don't forget about the urinary retention. Uh, we just had a, a gentleman last week who. Um, had been falling, couldn't figure out what was going on. Um, and then what we found is that he, we, we did a straight cath um, because we were, we were trying to get an MSU and he had a, over a liter of, of uh, residual urine. So he was in urinary retention. Um, and so because of an enlarged prostate. So don't forget about urinary retention. So the other things to do are the non-pharmacological, non, the is still really good basic nursing care, and um, it's things like make you know try to give them something stimulating to do during the day, so that when night comes they actually realize that it's night. Because a lot of things, a lot of times with delirium is that fluctuation um, in uh, day-night cycle. Um, uh, make sure they have plenty of light during the day. Make sure it's nice and quiet at night. Um, depending on the person, if they already have dementia, I don't try to reorient them. But if they don't have dementia and they've gotten delirious, um, it's not a bad idea to try to reorient them, have their families come in um, during the day, tell them what day it is, you know, try to get them reoriented. The next step is to assess for pain. Pain medications in older people is a problem because there are so many adverse side effects. So the first thing is paracetamol. That's basic. Everybody knows that. The next, I have been really happy with di diclofenac gel, Voltaren gel. Um, it's topical. Only 2% or less gets into the system, so I don't worry about side effects. It gives the chance to have, particularly with um, uh, musculoskeletal pain, it gives the chance for a little bit of massage, and there's actually a pathophysiological reason why that, that massage will help. So don't forget about the diclofenac gel rather than the opioid. Um, opioids I do use, of course, um, but I the really important thing about opioid, it's always on my short course list, not on my long term, long course list if I can get out of it. <laughs> People that have been on opioids for a long time trying to get them off opioids is my ongoing struggle. But for those, I never start, I never start a long term opioid. I always try to put it on my short course list because if they need it, they need it for a short course. And then to give them, you know, uh, tapering doses over a week or two can really get them through the hard part. And then you, then they're not on this long-term opioid. There is no evidence for effectiveness of chronic pain in, in opioids. Honestly, when, you know, in 1999, when I was uh, uh, working in internal medicine, um, we did have people come to the office and uh, from the, those drug companies that have now um, been uh, uh, sued that basically told us, I remember distinctly, they said, if you had pain, you could not get addicted to opioids. That is wrong. I don't care who you are or how old you are or what pain you have, you can get addicted to opioids. So we, we just need to really change our thinking that way. Um, there's a nice pain assessment in the care guides called the pain and uh, again, it just it's particularly helpful for people with dementia who can't tell you where their pain is or what's happening with their pain. It's very good to use with the healthcare assistants or the family to try to uh, articulate that pain a little bit better. Don't forget about neuropathic pain. It's the shooting electric pain. Um, gabapentin is not a bad drug, although it makes people really tired, and it's really hard to titrate up and titrate down because you've got to do it really slowly and the full dose of 1,200 um, milligrams a day, which is a whole lot for older people. I do like pregabalin. Um, pregabalin is easier to titrate. The dosages are much smaller. I think it's uh, once or twice a day. 
Um, the other thing about pregabalin that I quite like is that I have seen it have a little bit of an anti-anxiety effect as well. And that's one of the differences between that and gabapentin. Gabapentin makes you sleepy. Pregabalin can just make you a little bit less anxious. And then the carbamazepine for trigeminal neuralgia. Tricyclic antidepressants still um, are good for um, neuropathic pain, um, but they have all the anticholinergic effects, which we're not fond of. So these are the ones that you want to kind of think about not using. Uh, NSAIDs, for sure. Uh, in older people, you just don't use them. Uh, every occasionally, I will get talked into it if their EGFR is greater than 60, but and if they're younger. Um, but for the most part, I do not use NSAID or COX-2 inhibitors. Um, but they work so great on inflammatory pain. So that's the conundrum is that people have been on them for years and years and years, know they work um, as their kidney function has slowly deteriorated. Don't forget about the triple whammy, NSAIDs, diuretic and ACE inhibitors. You increase the risk for acute kidney injury. You can shut down their kidneys with that. The other thing is gout on the guidelines. It often says NSAIDs uh, for gout pain, but for older people, because NSAIDs aren't what we want to use, steroids work like a charm. So we want to use prednisone for gout um, and then follow up that gout to make sure that we've got long-term control better. Do a urate, for instance. Tramadol, again, it's one of those things that they come to me and they're on tramadol, I'll deal with it, but I don't put people on tramadol. It's not some, a new medication I put people on. It has the serotonin, it can have a serotonin effect. So if they're on an antidepressant, like SSRI, the tramadol can send them into a serotonin crisis. So I, I do find people uh, get more delirious on tramadol. Some people tolerate it just great. It's very individual. Um, so you have to kind of do that as a real personalized way. Codeine is not my favorite. Um, if you're gonna use an opioid, just use an opioid, just use morphine because Codeine is metabolized into morphine anyway. This is another drug that people just get on for years and years and years and years and years, and getting them off it is really difficult. Um, it's very constipating. Um, so I just, codeine's not, if I'm going to use an opioid, I'm going to use morphine for short term. And again, opioids for long term. Assess the bowels, um, like I said earlier, constipation. Uh, and diarrhea, but mainly constipation can really throw people into a, an acute deterioration. A couple of quick notes about uh, a bowel. Um, try all the non-farm stuff first. Fluids, walking, fruit, salads, whatever you can. Um, I like Laxol. Laxol uh, is actually quite gentle. Um, people tolerate Laxol really well, so two tablets at night or two tablets BD can really keep people going. There uh, was a recent article last year that talked about, I used to think that if you took Laxol um, long term, that it would eventually uh, become ineffective because the body would get used to it. And actually this article is saying, no, there's no long-term effect, Laxol's fine. The second line, if they haven't had a bowel motion in three days, then that's when I really definitely want to start um, Mobicol or Mo Molaxol um, works great, but sometimes you really got to use a lot of it. If they're really, really bunged up, um, particularly from an opioid, you know, two, three times a day is not uncommon. Um, but the other thing about Molaxol that's important to kind of consider is somebody who has Parkinson's disease, they have a real... Um, uh, uh, para, their peristalsis is, is affected as well from the Parkinson's disease. And so um, if you give a bulking agent like psyllium husks to somebody with Parkinson's disease, basically all you've done is fill up that bowel that's not moving anyway. But if you get, Malaxol does a really nice job um, once a day, once twice a day for people with Parkinson's disease where constipation is one of the side effects of Parkinson's disease. Couple of, we don't do fleet cinemas anymore because of the electrolytes uh, disturbance. And we know from research that uh, people that had fleet cinema had higher mortality than those that didn't. But I do, uh, I do like a Michael enema, um, and I think those work quite well. Uh, we don't do manual removal. 
you try to do everything you can to not do that unless it's absolutely, absolutely bad. So again, the, the fleet on them on the manual removal, I might do once a year um, just because it's so bad. But other than that, you we really should be onto this. And then last but not least on the on the goals of care, it, it, step eight is to review the goals of care. So what are, you know, are they for hospitalization? Are they not? Uh, what it's so important to get what the family and the and uh, and the Fano feel about the situation. What do they want to happen now? Are they for comfort? Um, we've got palliative care guides, of course. I'm not going to go over those today. But one of the things that we do have that I quite like is when I'm talking to families every six months about their goals of care or their advanced care plan, is to try to keep in mind um, these three levels of care. There are the ones um, I've got a, a, a woman who, and we've all those of us that work with older people in long-term care know this, we have people in stage dementia, they are eating and sleeping and but not interacting at all. They're not mobilizing, they're end stage. They're, they are really, really dying of dementia. And I got a call from the nurse saying, uh, her pulse rate is uh, 38. <laughs> it's like, okay. Well, for her goals of care, she's been in this end stage dementia place for about four to five years. That, that bradycardia is, is concerning for somebody who is younger and active and walking around, but for her, it's just part of the end stage process. So we're not going to do anything about that. So it's really important to understand the goals of care. And to get that family on board, you will save yourself so much headache and heartache if you talk to the family and that older person first, because when the acute deterioration happens, it is clear, we've talked about it, it's a very meaningful clinical interaction because you've already had that really hard conversation. I'm going to talk a little bit about behaviors that challenge. Um, they challenge us. They don't usually challenge the person. Um, however, this is my bottom line. If that behavior is, um, is causing that person distress, then I need to do something about it. Wandering, people that wander, eh, it's not causing anybody distress. Um, so the other kind of bottom line, and you all have, would know this, is if they're causing distress to others, as in hitting um, aggression, um, physical uh, aggression or sexual disinhibition. So one of the things that we have to do is what are the causes? And it takes uh, uh, one of the facilities I work in, we have a person that's been doing this kind of work for decades and she's fantastic. Um, she's, a, she's just known for her ability to work with people with aggressive behavior. And what she'll do is she'll sit down with us and have a long conversation about, okay, so could, did we try this? Did we try that? What, you know, what's the precipitating factor? What helps? We all know about sand denning. Um, and basically it's just that as you're trying to keep oriented every day, the, you get tired and by the end of the day with dementia, you just can't keep oriented anymore. So the sun downing is, is just what we call a progressively lower, lowered stress threshold. It's like for any of us, the more tired you get, the less likely you are to be rational <laughs> or be kind um, and those kinds of things. Um, BPSD, the behavior and the psychological symptoms of dementia, the psychological symptoms, anxiety, depressed mood, paranoia, hallucinations, delusions, those are the ones that I need to treat with an antipsychotic, absolutely, they are they are distressed by those. There's also behavioral symptoms, screamings, restlessness, wandering. Those are you want to definitely start with those. Start with the non-farm stuff. What is it that is causing that distress? And that takes um, some detective work and and teamwork. So there's the uh, ABCs of BPSD. So what's the activating factor? What's making this happen? Um, uh, what happened is the result of A, uh, what's the consequences of B, you know, are they hungry, um, are they sick, uh, you know, do they have a, are they depressed? Uh, one of the things in my practice is that somebody who is aggressive and cranky and hitting out at people, I'm not going to start with an antidepressant for, excuse me, an antipsychotic first, 
I, tr I usually try to start with an antidepressant first and 50, 60% of the time it works. They settle right down just like anybody who's depressed, they're irritable. And then they have cognitive impairment on top of that. So I find that antidepressants can work quite well. Decide, debrief, de-escalate, get out of the way, um, get some teamwork. Um, and just this kind of assessment is really important for the team to do. We've pretty much talked about this, so I'm gonna move on. Um, so a couple of things that are really important, focus on the feelings, uh, not the fact. Don't focus on what they're saying to you, focus on the feeling behind what they're saying to you. Don't get upset with that person uh, and, and don't take anything they're saying. Uh, it, you are um, a, a professional and look, I've had the most rude things said to me, I'm sure we all have, um, and it's not them, it's the disease. So that's an important thing. Relaxing activities, music does wonders, massage does wonders, exercise does wonders. Um, get them distracted, get it, try something else. We, you, you, that's a real trick that everybody learns early on. And it is really important to, if you are being, a, you know, uh, if you feel like you are losing uh, your temper, let's just say it like that, you need to, you need to leave and you need to get somebody else in to help you with that, get a team approach, you need to take a break. Um, it is particularly, for instance, somebody with frontal temp temporal lobe dementia, they sound so coherent and what they're saying is so awful sometimes and you just have to take a break and, or, and get your team members to help you with it. And make sure the person is safe. Um, basic communication skills, talk slowly, uh, simple sentences, don't give them multiple commands at once because people with cognitive impairment, they just, just put your pants on, walk over here, you know, short, simple commands are most important. Um, touch helps, they, one of the things, after all these decades of working with people with dementia, it's not what you say, it's how you say it, and it's this True for anybody, it's not, it's not what you say, it's how you make people feel. Um, so it's that sitting down at eye level, it's the holding their hand, it's the, you know, I do a lot of hugs pre-COVID. Um, it's the tone of voice, it's the lovingness, the kindness, that, that kind of doesn't, you could say anything as long as, for somebody who has severe dementia, as long as it's loving. The other thing that does help is, um, is for people that are expressing and can understand is to say, you look unhappy, tell me what's going on and really listen, uh, what's, what's happened to upset you. It is really important. There are always 20 sides to every story. So listen to their side of the story. Um, never argue with a person who's aggressive. Oh man, I, 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 we all fall into this trap. Uh, I can recall a situation with somebody just a few months ago that had uh, a frontal temporal lobe damage due to alcohol. And again, front, I find frontal temporal damage really difficult because he sounds so with it. But then, and so then he's, he said something that was really offensive and I, and I, I started to come back at him. And then I realized, oh, that was dumb. You know, you're just going to provoke him more. He has no inhibition for his emotions, and so you're just going to send him off into a spiral. So don't ever argue with a person. Meet them with compassion. Remember it's the disease and not them. The other thing to think about with compassion is to think about families. Families, uh, you know, the last, when you have an angry family, the last thing you want to do is sit down with them and talk to them, believe me. But it is so important to think about compassionately about that family. First of all, they're grieving. And having my own family member in residential aged care, the grief shocked me at how much grieving I was doing about, that, about my loved one being in care. They feel guilty because they can't do the care themselves and they want to so bad that it's just too much for them. They feel overwhelmed. They often get disappointed and frustrated with the system. And the worst of all is they get angry and you just happen to be in the pathway of that anger. And so the most important thing to do about family communication is to sit down and listen and be present.
doesn't mean that, and don't take it personally. So be present, be objective, re-listen, write down the concerns of the family. That is a very strong signal to that family that you're actually really listening. And also then say, I will make sure somebody gets back to you about this, or you get back to them about it. Getting back to somebody about a problem, it creates uh, immense trust. You, I often have to say, I, I can't really do anything about this situation, but this is what I've done to try to figure it out. Um, so it makes a huge difference. So make sure the family's been heard, register the concerns, and let them know what the plan is. We all have worked with very demanding families, and the more demanding they are, the more time I spend with them because I need to establish that trust. And once I have that trust, it settles things down. They are just anxious and want to make sure that their loved one gets the best care possible. Just check yourself. Are you defensive? Are you open or closed to discussion? You know, if you sit down and you're not, you just think that family is just silly and ridiculous and why are they bringing this up and we've tried everything we can and we've done this and we've done that and everything, they're going to know that. So just, you've got to go in with compassion. You got to go in with a sheet of paper and a pencil and pick one thing that you can do something about. It could be the smallest, tiniest little thing, but pick that one thing that you can do something about. Um, don't talk over somebody else. And last but not least, keep smiling. Uh, we don't know what the next year or two has to bring for us in residential aged care. I am deeply grateful to a country that sees uh, and works together as 5 million people to make sure that we didn't get COVID to the most vulnerable people that I care for. Um, so um, I'm happy to take any questions. I'm gonna stop sharing now. Uh, first question from Helen. <laughs> Hi, Michael. She says, were you aware that the stop and watch tool is being used currently by HCNZ as an easy assessment guide for support workers? Uh, I think it's great. I mean, I think it's a really important, it's a really, it's a great tool. It's not, there's nothing wrong with that tool, but it doesn't tell us what the next step is. That's the only point. Okay. The next one is actually a, um, a recommendation for all. Please liaise with the di diversional and recreational therapists as they are your best allied health professionals to develop programs for your residents. Cognitive stimulating activities during the day, the DRT may also deliver massage therapy, etc. So that's just a, a recommendation. Great. I agree completely. And somebody else has just volunteered the information or is wondering if you are familiar with the Vera Net framework for communicating with people with a dementia and what your thoughts are in relation to this tool. Which, which tool? It's called Vera, V-E-R-A. Uh, is, um, is that the, um, um, what, what, um, it's right on the tip of my tongue, validation therapy. Um, is that the validation therapy? Um, uh, I love Person, if it is validation therapy, I love validation therapy. Validation therapy is creative um, in that you're just following that person with, it doesn't matter what they're saying, you're following where they're going with it. And believe me, I've had some really st stimulating and interesting times trying to follow people with dementia. So I, so hopefully that's probably what mm. Mm. And those are the questions that have come in. As far as I can see, let me just go down and check. Oh, validate, reassure, emote. Yeah. So it is, it is a, a, a I, get, I see this chat. It is a, a validation tool. Um, okay. So, yeah. Uh, I think I've got another one here. Um, if an older person is admitted, e.g. on metropropol, or rate control, but has a low BP, what would be your approach? Can you say that one again? You could cut out. If an older person is admitted, or for instance, on metapropyl for rate control oh, has right. a low BP, what would be your approach? Yeah, look, that's a really good um, point. So first of all, th there's a couple things to unpack with that. First of all, um, what we know now is we don't want older people to have low blood pressure, systolic blood pressures. We want people to have uh, older people to have higher for the perfusion in the brain, but also for falls. So 120, 130 is, is where we want to keep them. So if they're, let's say that they're on 47.5 of metoprolol, and um, I will often decrease that to 27, uh, sorry, 23.75. 
Um, the other, the other, so yes, you definitely want to do a deprescribing for anti uh, hypertensive meds and get those blood pressures up just a little bit because with their, when the systolic is 109 you know, or 90, um, it's too low. That's too low for older people. The other thing I would suggest, and I just adore is my clinical pharmacist reviews. So I work with some fantastic, amazing clinical pharmacists at Wimata DHB who do clinical reviews with us, uh, pharmacy reviews with us once a month. They are invaluable. So use your clinical pharmacist. Right. Here's a good one. What can the hospitals do better for people with dementia behavior? Well, it's the same sorry, thing. That sorry, it's it better for caring for people with delirium. Ah, uh, delirium. Right. So basics. I, I, you know, first of all, make sure that their bowels are moving, that they're hydrated, that they don't have any other mm -hmm. un underlying, it's all the basics, underlying illnesses, but also quietness and making sure that they can see the sun during the day and that it's nice and dark during night um, and get them tired, walk them around. And now all of that takes staff. And I understand that that's one of the biggest problems, but if you can, you know, keep trying, trying to get them oriented during the day, having family come in, take them for walks. Um, that's one of the best things you can do as well as the basic good nursing care. Oh, just by the way, I will say, um, do you, do you use an antipsychotic, uh, for delirium? Eh, there's some, we try to avoid it. Um, you certainly don't want to start with lorazepam. I'm just going to say that. Don't start with a benzo. If you are going to treat delirium pharmacologically, you don't start with benzos. You start with an antipsychotic. Um, we, the most evidence out there is for haloperidol, but um, there's also evidence for the atypicals like risperidone uh, or quetiapine. Um, but also remember that as people get frailer, they have less uh, response to the antipsychotics. So that's only if you can not, uh, if they're so distressed that you do need to do something, um, you want to think of an antipsychotic. Short term. And a similar question, Michael, what's the best medication for severe dementia behavior? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a hard one. Um, <laughs> We used to use risperidone a lot because it didn't have as many side effects as the, you know, the, the other older antipsychotics. I'm, I'm quite a fond, a friend of quetiapine these days for just short term, it needs to be reviewed, it needs to be reviewed at three months, but quetiapine can settle people down. It, I don't usually start people on olanzapine myself. I'll get the mental health uh, team to come in and help me and give me a direction. So that's the other thing is that I'm kind of comfortable with quetiapine. But before I do quetiapine, I'm going to start an anti uh, excuse me, an antidepressant. My favorite antidepressant is tazepine. You give it at night. It stimulates the appetite. It helps people um, feel a little tired. I always start with a half a dose. It doesn't drop the sodium like um, SSRIs does, but the big side effect is because it stimulates the appetite. If you have somebody who's got, uh, who is obese, it's going to make that worse. If I have the skinny, frail, older person who's not eating very well anyway, mirtazapine can lift their mood, help them sleep, and um, decrease their aggression and, and grumpiness. And often that'll de decrease, um, they'll just lift. Mm. And just time for a quick last one, although it may not be so quick. Can you suggest bowel management for a resident who has a, a vaginal fistula, poor oral intake, and is bed bound? Uh, she can't manage oral tablets. Now say that again, I, some of them I missed. So um, can you suggest bowel management for a resident, a fistula in the vagina, poor mm. intake, and is bed bound? She can't manage tablets, oral tablets. Yeah, and she probably can't do sachets either. Um, to tell you the truth, um, in that situation, I'd probably do a Michaelette enema. Those enemas work quite well, um, and it would stimulate the bowel. Now, I hope you guys um, all stay well and happy, and um, hopefully we'll, in a couple of years, just have some good stories. Thank you so much, Michael. Thank you very much.